Our opening words this morning are by Jack Reamer. And I'm going to use the first half of this reading as our opening words, and the second half as our prayer a little later this morning. Now is the time for turning. The leaves are turning from green to red and orange. The birds are beginning to turn and are heading once more toward the south. The animals are beginning to turn to storing their food for the winter. For leaves, birds, and animals, turning comes instinctively. But for us, turning does not come so easily. It takes an act of will for us to make a turn. It means breaking with old habits. It means admitting that we have been wrong. And this is never easy. It means losing face. It means starting all over again. And this can be painful. It means saying, I am sorry. It means recognizing that we have the ability to change. These things are hard to do. But unless we turn, we will be trapped forever in yesterday's ways. I'd like to take a moment in her absence to recognize Alison Lang for her contribution to the Fantasia Fair conference and for bringing Fantasia Fair and the UU Meeting House together so many years ago. Thank you, Allison, and we send you all of our good wishes this morning. I also just want to remark on how far we've come in society in recognizing gender diversity. Here's a milestone that I read about in the news this month. In Concord, New Hampshire, the student body of Concord High just voted Ray Ramsey to be homecoming king. Ramsey, who is a senior this year, is the first transgendered student to be elected by his fellow students as Concord High royalty. Beginning high school as Rachel, Ray came out as transgender in his junior year, but he remembers dressing and acting as a boy, even as a small child. A friend asked him in kindergarten one day why he dressed like a boy. And he said, without thinking, I'm a boy girl. Last year, Ray was able to come out as a transgendered teen. And this year, he will be enjoying his senior year as homecoming king. And by the way, he won that homecoming vote by a landslide. Since his win at the beginning of October, he said students that he doesn't even know have been congratulating him in the hallways. May the children continue to lead us. Continuing with the words by Jack Reamer. Spirit of life, help us to turn from callousness to sensitivity, from hostility to love, from pettiness to purpose, from envy to contentment, from carelessness to discipline, from fear to faith. Spirit of life, turn us toward each other, for in isolation there is no life. Amen. Reading is The Art of Forgiveness by David Blanchard. Forgiving is somewhat reckless, typically illogical act. A leap of faith, if you will. When Jesus preached forgiveness, people thought he was insane. Loving your neighbor is one thing, but your enemies too. When struck on the cheek, offer the other. If someone takes your coat, give him your cloak as well. We may think it was easy for Jesus to say this, his father being God and all, but what about those of us who live the real world? Do we have to do it too? I suppose it depends on what we want from life. 
Forgiveness in the world is still a bit reckless and illogical. But so is love, having children, or creating anything that we are willing to give away. But we do these things all the time, and we trust that because we have done them, we will be more fulfilled, more connected, more present to the joys and wonders of the world. In the end, those who have found a way to forgive know that the most profound work of forgiveness is done not for those who want it, but for those but for the sake of mending our own soul for the freedom that we find when we recklessly squander our forgiveness. My colleague, Reverend Gary Smith, now retired, once preached, if ever there was a doubt that this business of forgiveness is one big thing, Please note that the Protestant church in which I grew up always ended up splintered over what words to say in that part of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins, until the order of service had to tell us the Lord's Prayer using trespasses. In a true intellectual tradition, he said, it's far easier to fight over the words than to get right to the forgiveness part. Getting to the forgiveness part. It's one big thing. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If I were rewriting that prayer, I'd be tempted to say, Forgive us our trespasses and help us to forgive those who trespass against us. Because it's not easy. On either end, the apology end or the forgiveness end, the giving or the receiving of forgiveness. I know that in this room, we have endured a lot that is hard to forgive. We each carry with us histories of hurts and abuses that are inexcusable, that have scarred us more deeply than we would care to admit. And so this morning I do not offer a naive call for a blanket forgiveness for the wrongs done to us. I know it is more complicated than that. But I also know that there is healing that happens with forgiveness. And that the healing is not always about the relationships involved. And it is not always a selfless act. Sometimes it is an act of self-preservation. There is an element of forgiveness that gets to our own woundedness and which helps those raw places to heal. This week I read a memoir by a woman a year younger than myself. It's hard to believe that someone in their 30s has already written a memoir. But believe me, Amanda Lindhout has had the experiences of many lifetimes. And she has a lot of wisdom about forgiveness. I think Amanda's first wisdom about forgiveness came from her troubled childhood. I used to joke that my childhood seemed tailor-made for the Jerry Springer show, she said. <clears throat> Not just an episode, more like a whole season. My mom had a thing for bad men. My dad was one of the few openly gay people in town. My grandparents prayed fervently to Jesus, speaking in tongues when the occasion called for it. My brother struggled with drugs. I too, she said, had issues. I often starved myself to stay thin, obsessively counting calories. Still, she says, we tried. 
The year that Eddie, her mother's abusive boyfriend, was sent to jail, Amanda's father called her mother and tentatively invited her to come over for Christmas. They'd softened toward each other, Amanda says, over forced communication about school schedules and which child needed new shoes. Also, Perry and her father were as settled and married-like as the next couple, more so than her mother had ever been with any of her men. And slowly, her mother had come to appreciate this. Christmas morning, Amanda's mother walked through her dad and Perry's door with its tinseled wreath and velvety red bow, smiling at everyone, apologizing all over the place that she hadn't been able to afford gifts. What she'd brought was a painstakingly written batch of letters printed on pages of commuter, computer stationery with colorful Christmas lights around the borders one for each person in the room. I opened my letter and read it slowly, Amanda writes. In it, she described a few of her best memories, clear and happy moments, like the two of us horsing around in front of the mirror in that basement apartment, fluffing up our hair. She spelled out her love for me and her hopes that I would always have good luck and great adventures. I don't know what she put in the other letters, says Amanda. All I know is that every one of us was silent and a little teary. After that, we spent every Christmas together. We would never be a close family exactly, but we loved one another in a certain fierce way. So yes, I think Amanda learned something of forgiveness from her family and those hard years of her childhood. That there is an element of letting go involved. An element of moving on. An element of lifting up the positive and letting the rest fall away. Amanda would soon need to call on these lessons in forgiveness in a new way. At the age of 24, Amanda quit her job as a cocktail waitress in Canada to become a journalist. She used her savings to finance reporting trips to countries all over the world. She was drawn to areas of conflict, believing that taking risks was the fastest way to catapult her budding career. She began in Afghanistan, then moved to Iraq, the next summer, Amanda traveled to Somalia, known as the most dangerous place on earth. Four days after arriving in Mogadishu, Amanda and her friend Nigel Brennan, a 37-year-old photojournalist from Australia, were kidnapped on their way to cover a story. The abductors were armed teenage insurgents from a fundamentalist Islamic group. They demanded a ransom of $3 million for the release of Amanda and Nigel. The Canadian and Australian governments refused to pay on the grounds that it would support terrorism. Their families did not have that much money. For the next 15 months, Amanda and Nigel were held in a hell of captivity. They were beaten, starved, and humiliated. Amanda was abused and kept in the dark. In an attempt to earn better treatment, both Amanda and Nigel converted to Islam. They prayed five times a day and studied the Quran. They tried to be model prisoners. Then they tried to escape. They were recaptured. I tell Amanda's story because as I struggle to forgive the small trespasses that have been made against me and to journey with others who are struggling to let go, it helps to sit in awe of someone who is struggling with this task on such a different scale. Amanda's kidnappers held and tortured her for over a year. 
And yet somehow she did not let this darkness consume her. She did not give up her own light. In the midst of deep despair and a desperate situation, Amanda used what she had learned of holding on to the good to get herself through each day. I tried to locate what had been good about the day that had just passed, she said. I looked for any moments when my captors had shown their humanity. I am thankful that today Jamal set my food down on the floor instead of throwing it at me. I am grateful that Abdullah offered the greeting, Assalamu alaikum, when he came into my room. I am happy that I heard a few seconds of the boys laughing and horsing around in the hallway today because it reminded me, if only for a minute, that somewhere inside each of them is a teenager who just wants to be carefree. This week, I immersed myself in Amanda's story as I read her book, A House in the Sky. Her story is beautiful and difficult to read at the same time. Her resilience is unimaginable. After 460 days of captivity, her family, along with Nigel's family, finally secured their release by selling and mortgaging everything they owned, by begging and borrowing money from family and friends, and hiring a private risk management company specializing in kidnap and hostage release. On November 25th, 2009, Amanda was rescued from Somalia. The greatest lesson I learned from her is this. We may not be able to forgive immediately or completely, but there is a deep healing that comes in pointing ourselves towards forgiveness. She says, I think often about the boys who held me hostage. How could I not? My feelings about them can't e be easily measured or fixed, especially as time goes by. That's another set of sliding abacus beads. For my own good, she says, I strive toward forgiveness and compassion above all the other feelings, anger, hatred, confusion, self-pity that surface in me. I understand that those boys and even the leaders of the group were products of their environment, a violent, seemingly unending war that has orphaned thousands of children and reaches back over 20 years now. Amanda Lindhout survived her captivity and went on to found a nonprofit organization called the Global Enrichment Foundation to help support education in Somalia. She says, I'd spent so much time in captivity wondering about the boys who guarded me, specifically whether they would have been different, less entrenched in extremism and war, if they'd had more opportunities to go to school. And maybe, more meaningfully, if they'd been raised in homes where their mothers and sisters had been able to go to school. The Global Enrichment Foundation partners with other organizations to help bring about change in Somalia, providing food aid and supporting girls' basketball teams and funding scholarships to Somali women attending university, funding a primary school, and constructing a community library. Part of why forgiveness is so hard, part of why Amanda is so amazing, is that our brain clings to bad memories more fiercely than to good ones. The brain handles positive and negative information in different hemispheres. Studies show that negative emotions generally involve more thinking and the information is processed more thoroughly than positive ones. 
So we tend to ruminate more about unpleasant events and use stronger words to describe them than for happy ones. We also, by the way, hang on to criticism more than praise, loss more than reward. As with many other quirks of the human psyche, there may be an evolutionary basis for this. Those who are more attuned to bad things would have been more likely to survive and consequently would have increased the probability of passing along their genes. Survival requires urgent attention to possible bad outcomes, but less urgency with regard to good ones. And yet, in all the world's religious traditions, we learn about forgiveness and the need to let go of our negative experiences and feelings and guilt. In Judaism, the holiday Yom Kippur is set aside as a day of atonement. In the Quran, we find these words, although the just penalty for an injustice is an equivalent retribution, those who pardon and maintain righteousness are rewarded. St. Francis of Assisi wrote, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. The Buddha said, you will not be punished for your anger. You will be punished by your anger. Perhaps religion is working against biology here, but across the board, it seems that the faithful life calls for apology and forgiveness. Our spiritual lives call on us to loosen our grip on our bad memories because our spiritual lives are not concerned with the survival of the species but with the survival of our souls. And the survival of our souls, the healing of our souls requires us to let go our death grip on our bad experiences, our anger, our hatred, our fear. It does not require us to continue in relationship with those who have hurt us. But it asks us to move on, to move forward. Amanda says, I choose to forgive the people who took my freedom from me and abused me, despite the fact that they were doing what they were doing was absolutely wrong. I choose also to forgive myself for the impact that my decision to go to Somalia had on family and friends at home. Forgiving is not an easy thing to do, she says. Some days it's no more than a distant spot on the horizon. I look toward it. I point my feet in its direction. Some days I get there, and other days I don't. More than anything else, though, it's what has helped me move forward with my life. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Something to point our feet toward. Amen, and blessed be.